This is Your Morning Basket, where we help you bring truth, goodness, and beauty to your homeschool day. Hi, everyone. It's Pam Barnhill, and welcome to Episode 4 of the Your Morning Basket podcast. It's really great to have you guys here with me today. Well, I hope your school year has gotten off to a great start and your morning time. And speaking of morning times, because, yeah, that's what we talk about here. People have been sharing with me pictures of their morning times at the hashtag Your Morning Basket on Instagram and other social media. It's been a lot of fun to go through there and see lots of cute baskets and lots of cute kids having a great time learning during morning time. So I just want to encourage you to do that. Share your photos, hashtag your morning basket on Instagram, Twitter, and other social media, and I'll be checking that out to have a look and see what you guys are up to in morning time in your home. Well, today I get to interview a favorite mentor of mine. This is Dr. Christopher Perrin from Classical Academic Press. I had the wonderful opportunity to take a class with Dr. Perrin this summer on Scole in your school and homeschool, and it was such a blessing to me. And I was really happy when he agreed to come on to the podcast and talk to us about that third R, ritual. So this will tie up the reading, recitation, and ritual podcast, kind of breaking open those R's of morning time. So sit back and enjoy the program. Dr. Christopher Perrin is the CEO of Classical Academic Press board vice president of the Society for Classical Learning, and the director of the Alcuin Fellowship of Classical Educators. He is also the Latin Magister in our home through his wonderful Song School Latin and Latin for Children materials. Dr. Perrin has an extensive background in teaching and writing about classical education, and he's a strong advocate for the revival of some of the lost practices of a liberal arts education. His thoughts on a return to scholae learning or a more restful contemplative style of education have been a breath of fresh air for many of us in the homeschool world. Dr. Perrin, welcome today. Thank you very much. Glad to be here, Pam. I'm so happy you're here. Could you start by telling us a little bit about what scholae is and how it might be an answer to the hectic and distracted nature of our lives? Sure. You know, the word scholae when I hear it, connotes now, after several years of thinking about it, reflecting on it, studying it, some rich ideas of a restful, thoughtful, more contemplative life pursued with friends who are studying the things that are truly worthwhile without distraction. Put another way, studying and seeking after that which is true, good, and beautiful with friends, often in a beautiful place with good food and drink. That's kind of the the idea behind this Greek word skole. And skole is a Greek word. It comes to us from Plato and Aristotle. Aristotle and his Nicomachean Ethics and his uh, book Politics talks about this ideal of a skole life in which friends are together seeking the true, the good, and the beautiful. Skole is sometimes translated as leisure, but and that's not a bad translation, but leisure, it's it's not sufficient because when we think of leisure in an American context, often we think of vacation and amusement and entertainment, and that's not what was meant by scole. It did mean free time. It did mean undistracted time, again, to be with friends, to reflect and discuss the things that are most important to us. That, therefore, is an important component to becoming a well-educated person, to actually have time to consider deeply the things that are most important. And sometimes in American education, we move through things so fast, covering material and checking off boxes and moving through chapters that we find it very difficult to slow down and actually possess something in an intellectual way. I think we all understand that. So there's a slow food movement out there. I've had a chance to go to Italy once or twice and the Italians take their time when they have dinner. If you go out to dinner in Italy, and get a table, you'll be there for three or four hours. And good luck trying to speed the process along. They just won't do it. And they take breaks during the day, in the middle of the day, to be with their family. 
have lunch and close down shops and so on. And this kind of way of living in America seems kind of alien to us. But applied to an academic life, it means that we dig some deep wells and take time to truly master and study things that are that are worthwhile. And I'll give you just one illustration and application, Pam, and then you can feel free to ask some follow-up questions because I'm just really trying to introduce the concept. If you're studying literature in upper school, say in high school, how many novels should one read? If you take AP Lit in a typical American high school, you might move through 18 or 22 novels in a year. You cover them, you read them, and the idea is to be exposed to them, but not really to drink deeply from any one author. Uh, so just about the time you're starting to digest for whom the bell tolls, you're on to cry the beloved country, and you're beginning to see that this book is profound and could really change the way you think about life in Africa and your own life and a life of ministry and family life, and then you're on to yet the next book. Sometimes we know things through a slow and deep study better. It's not to say that there isn't a place for doing a survey and covering some things quickly, getting the lay of the land. There's not to say that there isn't a place for doing research and there isn't a place for doing some hard work, but there's also a need for a place in our lives where we slow down and learn how to ponder, wander, gaze, and linger, and savor, and contemplate. This is, I'm trying to paint a picture, if you will, of what's behind this concept, this idea that is contained in the great Greek word skole. So usually when I talk about this, people sense, especially if they're in the Christian tradition, they say, oh, I, I know something about this because mm -hmm. it's, in, it's in our scriptures, those of us who are Christians. Psalm 27, David says, one thing he desires of the Lord, that he might dwell in the temple of the Lord and gaze upon his beauty all the days of his life. There's that, that episode in Luke where Jesus speaks to Mary and Martha in their home when Martha is busy working on dinner preparations and so forth, and Mary is sitting with Jesus having a great conversation, and Martha gets irritated and says to Christ, don't you care about me? It's an interesting way to open the conversation. <laughs> don't you care? Tell my sister to help me. She's not doing anything. <laughs> uh, and Jesus says, Martha, Martha, you're busy, you're anxious about many things, but Mary has chosen what is best, and it won't be taken from her. I think that sometimes we have not chosen what is best. And it's not altogether clear what this means for, say, a homeschooling curriculum and mm -hmm. lifestyle. But if we think deeply about this as an ideal, that we need to learn how to teach restfully and to flee from worry and anxiety. We know in the, script, in the Christian tradition that worry and anxiety actually can be characterized as sin. So sometime I think we are teaching out of worry and anxiety. We're not in a state of trusting God and His good providence, and we're, our reputations are are on the line as homeschooling families. Or our identities are too wrapped up in being a homeschooling mom or dad or family, and we want to justify and validate our decisions before our watching relatives and friends and neighbors. And so we will work hard like Martha to prove that we have made a good decision and that our kids will be fine and better prepared than any of the students going to public. All kinds of pride can slip in, various kinds of worry. Will my children be properly prepared if I don't get through this entire book of mathematics this year? You know, If I don't get through math four, what will happen? Because they'll fall behind, they won't get into college. So many things can weigh upon us that can create worry. And Scole is a tradition within the larger classical tradition that says, one of the most important things, not the only thing, but one of the most important things that we can do is learn how to restfully seek after the true, good, and beautiful. That was a really long <laughs> introduction to the concept of Scolet and to an opening question. I'm sorry, but no, there you have it. You brought in a lot of really great points, and I'm sitting over here nodding because I think that a lot of times the things that drive us away from this restful kind of learning are those very real concerns that we have. Even when we, we want to have more of a scole kind of learning in our home, what draws us away are these very real concerns and the watching relatives and things of that nature. So I don't think those things can be discounted. And I, I like the fact that you brought them up because I can say, yeah, I can see how these are the things that are pulling me away from sitting and contemplating, you know, doing the best things. So... Well, I think I want to ask you, what might Skole look like in a real life morning time? 
with Mm -hmm. wiggly and energetic kids. You're on one hand, you're telling me this is contemplation. This is restful learning. And on the other hand, I've got a 10 year old, an eight year old and a five year old. Sometimes it seems like contemplation and rest are just not in their vocabulary. Mm -hmm. So is Scola possible with a group like that? I think it is. But of course, a Scola or a restful approach to learning will adapt to changing situations, to to a changing family dynamic and to the, the development of our children and to our own life circumstances. But we do know that, and again, I'm appealing to those in your audience who are of the Christian tradition, we do know that we are to rest one day in seven. And that comes to us as a command. So resting is really not an option. We have to learn how to do this. And rest doesn't mean the cessation of activity. It means activity of a different sort, activity that is refreshing and calming and very much enjoyable and delightful, akin to hopefully what we experience when we worship, akin to what we experience when we have dinners together, akin to a a really good conversation at Starbucks with a friend where you're talking about something that's really important when there might be hubbub all around you and yet you're having a really meaningful conversation that refreshes you and even energizes you. That can be scole. A good Socratic discussion in a school setting with these older students talking about a novel or a, or a book of history or some concept can also be restful and energizing. You've had those conversations, haven't you, when time kind of changes and slips, you slip into a different kind of realm and you forget that time is passing. And, right. And after the conversation, you realize 45 minutes has gone by and you've been in kind of a different place. Some of us who have heard really great sermons have had that happen to us where, boy, you felt as if you were being directly addressed and you were in some way were transported. You transcended the kind of normal life that we experience. Those would be signals of that something restful has really happened. And not that we're looking for ecstatic moments, and so not everything will be that dramatic. But Joseph Pieper, in his book, Leisure, the Basis of Culture, referring to Thomas Aquinas, says that there's something about this life of intellectual vision, where you're kind of seeing things in your mind and experiencing them receptively as a gift rather than going out and grasping for them. He says that that's actually Aquinas says, a superhuman activity, that it's a part of what we enjoy as creatures made in the image of God that animals don't enjoy, but that angels do, and that this is one way in which occasionally we know truth in a kind of intellectual vision, contemplative vision, that's akin to the way angels know all the time. That's Aquinas speaking. So isn't that interesting to think that, you know, there's a, a sense, you know, now I'm thinking of Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, though I speak with the tongue of angels, but have not love, I am nothing. So there's something about contemplating something and going deep with something that's true, good, and beautiful that heals us and knows we are to be in union with God. Now, you've asked the question, what does this look like in a, um, you know, in a family where you have maybe two or three kids under 10 years old and so on? I think it can look in different ways, but let me tease out a couple of examples. I think it means some simple things that maybe some of your listeners are already doing, and that maybe that will comfort them, encourage them. A reading to your children. Children love to be read to. You put a child on your lap and read the right book, and they will slow down, and they will go into an imaginative place. And if it's a good story that teaches virtue and holiness and, the, and so forth, their moral imagination will be piqued, and they'll start to think about what it means to be a courageous person, say, or what it means to be a sacrificial person what it means to truly love in the midst of, in the face of adversity and so on. This is what the great stories do, the great poems, what scriptures do. And there's something in us that's calling out for this and wants to be cultivated by it. So literature, good literature is a way of kind of cultivating the soul. And how many times have we plopped one of our toddlers on our lap or even read to, you know, our eight-year-olds or nine-year-olds or 10-year-olds who just want to continue to read? That's Scole an encounter through the imagination of something true, good, and beautiful. So the right literature, of course, is important. Right. You don't want to read right. twaddle, as Charlotte Mason would say. Right. You want to read really good stuff. That begs another question, which is what maybe what should we read? Another example, I think, of where we find scole with kids is to be out in nature 
walking and talking and exploring. We should be doing that, in my view, uh, far more often than we do. In typical American schools, we have kids in buildings that are basically designed in a pattern that looks more like a prison <laughs> than anything else or a factory with fluorescent lights and you know tiled uh, floors and casement windows that you can't open and bells ringing and so on. We get to educate our children in our homes. And a related concept to Scole is what Plato called education that was musical education. He actually calls education for younger children musike, and it related to the Greek word muse, which meant muse, from which we get our word music and museum. But we also get our word amusement from these family of words. Amusia was that word for lacking inspiration. So our homes can be gardens, you know, that in out distinction, hopefully, if, if you live close to a park or have a yard or access to nature, it's much easier to do when you're raising your children in home. Mm -hmm. So I think our kids need to be outside a lot more and where they're playing and, and imagining re and even sometimes reimagining the stories that we've read to them as well as their more formal studies, walking, talking, gathering, collecting, discussing, tasting, climbing, experiencing the beauty of nature more deeply and widely. That's a simple thing that's just diminished greatly in our culture. So I think what I'm hearing you say is that scole or restful learning is not necessarily everyone perfectly peacefully quiet, listening with rapt attention to something that they're then going to sit silently and think about for a while. But this could be the sharing of a story between a mother and a child or getting out to walk in nature and behold what's around them. Those are the kinds of things. The restfulness is more energizing than it is being silent. Right. I think there's a, there's a place for some silent contemplation. There's nothing at all wrong with that. But con often when, when restful learning is occurring, it's occurring in a context where you're not feeling that pressure to have to do something else right away. A kind of sense of obligation. And for those of us who are adults, a kind of this sense that there's always something else to do that's not being done. And I'm already behind and I'm not sure things are going to go well those kinds of thoughts. Mm -hmm. And the sense that we can never be in one place and really be fully present, that would be a sign of anxiety rather than rest. And we've all seen that. We've been with people who are anxious and nervous. We've been this way ourselves. We're not really present in a conversation. We're juggling. We got plates spinning and we're just trying to manage and get through something. And that there's nothing wrong with that. There are times when that's actually just what we need to do. So it's not saying that our entire life should be characterized by this kind of restful state where we're engaging truth, goodness, and beauty. But the trouble is, for so many Americans, there's virtually never a time when it's happening at all. Right. So that's maybe some of your listeners might think I'm overemphasizing this. Well, that, that's probably true because we just don't do it at all or virtually ever. When's the last time that you've picked up your violin and played it just for the sheer pleasure of it? Why don't you play the piano anymore? Why don't you do watercolors anymore? You used to really enjoy gardening. You used to love to hike. You used to write your own poetry. You used to be a story writer and used to write songs and compose. Well, I have got to educate my kids now. So we're not even modeling for them a life of engagement of restful learning or scole because we think we have to be so busy about all this other stuff or we won't be successful. So we've adopted some kind of a view that is, uh, frankly, non-sabbatical. If we're to rest one day in seven, could we not think, what if we just as, a, as an ex thought experiment said to ourselves, what if one hour in seven in my homeschooling experience with my children, I'm going to make sure one hour in seven is restful? What if in every lesson I said, you know, if I'm teaching mathematics and I'm going to teach it for you know, 35 minutes, I'm going to take five minutes of that time and just make sure it's rest, a restful engagement with mathematics. What would that look like? How could I begin mathematics, say, with my children in a way that's true? I have 35 minutes, but the first five, 
or the last five are truly going to be contemplative. We're going to contemplate some aspect of math. We're going to enjoy and delight in math in some way. We're going to take our time. So I think what I'm hearing you say here is that we're going to have to be intentional about doing this kind of thing. We're going to have to maybe take ourselves out of the moment, take ourselves away from some of the decision fatigue that we're faced with a lot of times as homeschool moms, and maybe set up some practices ahead of time that are going to make us intentional about creating this atmosphere of school A learning in our home, which kind of brings me to the idea of liturgical practices or ritual in our homeschools and in our morning time. And I know that James K. Smith in Desiring the Kingdom talks about how we can use these liturgical practices to order our loves, you know, so we can learn to love what is lovely, that by doing these daily actions, we're going to change what is important to us. Is it really that easy? Is it really so easy as to simply do something every day that it's going to make us feel differently about things? Mm -hmm. It seems very simplistic. Yeah, Yeah, I think we have to be patient with ourselves because we're not going to do this really well, especially alone. We know this is why Jamie Smith in, in his book says we need the church. We need these liturgies from the tradition to help us. It would be wrong for us to think that we should just create these de novo. Like, you know, Pam, go out and create some really great practices that will think them up yourself. Why be restricted to anybody? You can do this on your own. Just figure out how to be restful. No, it's better for us to actually enter into a tradition and and to walk a path that others have walked, especially knowing that others are walking with us. And walking that path is not always easy. There are times when it's going to be challenging, to be sure. We have become habituated ourselves. And that's why I think you're right to say it would be simplistic to think that it's just going to be easy. Good night. Some of us would have trouble just not looking at our smartphones every morning when we wake up and every evening when we go to bed instead of reading a psalm. If we can't even do that, if we can't even read a psalm when we go to bed rather than checking email, well, then we're right to say it's simplistic to think that we could make these kind of liturgical changes in our home. But what it says is that we have been habituated ourselves. We have developed habits that are disordered. The way we order time, space, and language has been conditioned by a life of Facebook and TV and our own educations and the mall and constant shopping and all the driving we have to do and the soccer mom lifestyle, and so on and so forth. Those are our practices. Those are what we do without thinking about it, just like we brush our teeth, hopefully. (laughs) So we have become, our characters have been shaped and formed already by liturgical practices, if you will, using liturgy kind of loosely. So of course it's hard and not easy. Because you're already a liturgical creature, you've just been patterned after different liturgies, and you cannot change easily. That's why the great educators of the past said it's so important to help cultivate virtues in children when they're young, when you can help cement them so that they could become lifelong practices that become, as it were, second nature. Plato says that we should engage, expose children to things that are true, good, and beautiful, such that They have a taste for that which is true, good, and beautiful, even before they're reasoning about it very much, even before they're analyzing it. They're learning to kind of love the things that are lovely before they've even given it a lot of analytical thought. And so doing their characters are being formed, already learning to praise that which is beautiful and criticize that which is ugly. So I think part of the problem that we just have to be honest about is that, and I think is that we've already been trained. Right. And so what we're trying to do Jennifer Dow often talks about recovering the tradition. And so as we're trying to kind of recover these practices for our children, do you have a couple of maybe practical examples? And you've given us a couple with your, your mm-hmm. mathematics example earlier, but maybe mm-hmm. another example of a liturgy we could do as part of a morning time in our homeschool that would. Sure. I'll just throw out uh, again. I think these are really important questions and we need to keep talking about them with one another. I wish I was stronger at coming up with a really great practices myself. But let me just give you a few. We need to change the way we order time, space, and language as a way of trying to order our own loves properly to cultivate our affections. 
So one, I, I hope this will be practical. One mm -hmm. way to do this is to do a five cents inventory where you might even get out a journal or something and walk around the house or maybe just sit down someplace with a cup of coffee and think, what would I like to see when I come into my home that would attract my children to a, a restful learning state? What would they see in all of these various rooms? And then maybe to do some, uh, some thought, a thought experience and imagine what if I, if in an ideal world, what would I do to change the visual field of my home? What do they see? What does my homeschooling space look like? What is my homeschooling space? Is it a kitchen table with all kinds of stuff on it? Is there something that, you know, if you go into a really fine museum, it's designed to kind of order your thoughts and to direct your attention, but the way the lighting is and the, even the way the, the paintings are arranged are often thematic, right? And they're spaced apart a certain way. There's an arrangement to it that's been very intentional. And the same thing would be true of great architecture, a great church, and so on. So what about your home? And of course, we don't have the budgets to do everything we'd like to do, but what could we do if, we, what would we do if we could? And what can we do with what we have? And then I would go through all five senses. What do I hear throughout the day? And what might my children and I hear that would cultivate some rest? So I mentioned maybe playing music before mathematics starts. But again, Jamie Smith, you cited his book, Desiring the Kingdom. He says, we can look to the ecclesial tradition for some help here. We don't have to reinvent this de novo. And so even as you're imagining things, what you imagine is going to be, if you have a well-stocked imagination from the ecclesial tradition, you'll start imagining things that come from the church. What would it look like if there were an altar in my home that was set apart as a kind of sacred place where we read scripture together? What if there were a candle there? What if I... What if every time we studied scripture, we lit a candle and you taught your kids to, you know, talk about the Lord is my light and my salvation or and memorize a verse about the illuminating power of the Holy Spirit? And what if you memorize some prayers together? And what if every time you studied scripture or read scripture, you lit a candle to symbolize your desire for the Spirit of God to be present to help you understand his word? What about music? You know, mm -hmm. opportunities for great music to be playing around the household. I kick myself because we have a, a nice little stereo set up in our house. And all I need to do is plug in my smartphone and I mm -hmm. can play some of the most beautiful music through the house. And so many times I just don't do it. Right. You know, I'm, I'm washing dishes or something and I don't take advantage of filling the house. The whole first floor I could fill with beautiful music and there's nothing keeping me from doing it except my poor habits. <laughs> so what could you do with music? What could you do with smell? What, you know, oh, aromatic candles, for goodness sake, you know, churches have incense. Could you even have incense? You know, that might, just thinking about these traditional ways of ordering space that come to us from the church tradition could help us creatively engage our own homes and our own, ed our homeschool education. But what we do, Pam, I know you know this very well, and this is why you're right to point out that it sounds simplistic and easy. What we do when we think of education is we, our imagination has been stocked with ideas for what education should be. Right. But they're, but they're the wrong right. ideas. Right. We're back to the long halls and the casement windows and the fluorescent lights and the bells ringing and the anxious teachers and the huge backpacks and the eight classes a day. Because, as Jesus says, and I know you've heard me say this before, Luke 6, when a student's been fully trained, you'll be like his teacher. Right. So we've become like our teachers. We've been trained, and we've become like our teachers. Therefore, it is not easy to turn this around. Right. So practically, I would do that five, I would do the five cents inventory and start there. And then I would talk with other homeschooling moms and dads and say, what can we do here? What are you doing? And with morning time, what routines and rituals could you begin to create? And I would look to your own church tradition first. Yeah. I love that advice. I love the advice of looking to the church. We have a, a book that we've used for the past two or three years now called Children's Daily Prayer. And it's very much modeled after kind of a liturgy of the hours morning prayer. It starts with a just a brief reading, and then we do a, a psalm, and we go into a gospel reading of the day. So a very brief portion of scripture. And then it deviates a little bit in that we, we list intentions that we're praying for. 
and then finish with the Our Father. And so, you know, it's the same set pattern every day. The psalm changes through the liturgical season and the gospel, of course, changes for each day. But it, you know, it's patterned after prayer in the church, but it's a great way for us to begin prayer in our home each morning. That's excellent. And so I think that borrowing those ideas from your own church, Mm -hmm. that's a really great place to start to bring those liturgical practices home. They can also be informed the way you actually teach a math math class or lesson where you might begin, maybe you wouldn't do this every lesson, but maybe at least once a week, you'd say, let's something like this, let's stop and give thanks to God for mathematics because it reflects his mind. And it's a part of being like God. And when we come to know a mathematical truth, we're coming to know something about God who is the truth because all truth comes from him. And, you know, Again, because of our own poor educations, we sometimes feel handicapped, and that can create some stress. I understand that. But think about this just for a moment. When you, when you come to know a mathematical proof, you're coming to know something that is unchangeable, immaterial, and eternal. Isn't that lovely? That is. <laughs> so, you know, is. Th- th- there's, when someone says, is there anything else besides God that's immaterial? Well, well mathematic, mathematical proofs, logical proofs. So these are ways of the laws of logic. These are part of God. They emanate from God, who is the Logos. I wasn't taught math that way. Mm -mm. So what is there to praise about math? What is there to admire about it? Just the way I was taught, I became like my teachers. So to some degree, we have to unlearn, and we're trying to change a number of things in our own selves and in the way we teach as we recover this classical tradition of liberal arts learning, including Scole, this ability to rest and contemplate. So it's hard. Well, a couple of weeks ago, you said that you thought that morning time put children into a disposition for learning. Could you kind of unpack that a little bit and talk about what you mean by that? That's a great question. The way I'd like to answer that is, again, to appeal to the liturgical tradition of the church as an analogy. Imagine going to your church, say, that starts at 10 a.m., and you come in at 10 a.m., and at 10 a.m. short, your pastor begins to preach a stem-winding sermon with no preparation, welcome, and he starts to read a scripture passage, and then he's off and going preaching. When we come into the presence of God, we prepare ourselves. When Moses, God appeared to Moses, he said, take off your sandals. There's a kind of preparation. There's the need to be cleansed before a holy God. So it's natural that one of the first things we do is we confess our sin. We come to the presence of God. It's normal that we also give gratitude for the forgiveness of sins. And so a hymn of praise is often appropriate. And of course, there is sometimes a a recitation of a creed where we're together confessing what we believe as the church together. That's a part of the traditional liturgy. And then there is a sermon where the Word of God is opened and preached before us. And then there's a celebration of the sacrament of, of the Lord's Supper or Communion. And this is a time when all five senses are employed to engage us in the reality of the gospel. If you will, the Lord's Supper itself or communion is an extended period of contemplation of the gospel. Some theologians have called it the visible word. The word preached are words that hang in the air. The word of God, the communion is a visible. Five senses were contemplating the same gospel that perhaps we've heard about. So by extension, in a morning time or in a class, we could think through those elements of liturgy. Is there a prelude? What would your prelude be that would prepare you for what's going to come? And so if you're going to study some aspect of creation or truth, goodness, and beauty, it might be good to say, how do I, and what is there to confess? What petition is there to ask for? What do I seek? It's common in homeschools and Christian schools to have a brief prayer before we begin. Mm -hmm. But often it's kind of perfunctory and it's not very thoughtful. So, you know, a good church service that's thought out will prepare you well for the sermon, for the songs that you're going to sing. So there's a there's a rhetorical analysis here as well. It's not, you know, there's it flows, it it moves somewhere and then it properly leaves as well with a processional and a benediction. So I have found it helpful. And Jenny Rollins is one who is some folks have heard about who's thought a lot about liturgical learning and tried to implement it in a classical Christian school setting. I found it helpful to use those liturgical movements in a worship service to cultivate my imagination or spur my imagination to think how I would actually teach. So, you know, I, I'm sorry, Pam, that I'm not 
is clear sometimes that are giving really good practical examples. But I think when your listeners hear that, Mm -hmm. because they're intelligent teachers and parents, they start thinking about teaching math or history or literature. They start really deeply contemplating even the the forms of liturgy and applying it to a class or a morning time. Right. They will set their, they will properly dispose their children to enter into encountering truth, goodness, and beauty, God himself and the various arts that you're studying. You know, and that that's something that I have not really thought about myself. And now it will be churning over in my mind throughout the rest mm-hmm. of the evening, I'm sure, thinking about those ideas of modeling morning time after the liturgical practices that go on in a church service. And so I think that's great advice. And I think you're right. The listeners will be able to take that and kind of maybe in ways that they've never done before, look at their own church services and and kind of pick them apart a little bit. It's not something we want to do often (laughs) to a church service. We really just want to go and experience it. But if you're thoughtfully trying to order a morning time in your home that's going to put children in a disposition for learning, I don't think you could have a better model than that. Taking that and kind of pulling it apart a little bit and looking at the different practices and then using it as a model, I think it's going to be very helpful to a lot of people. If we wanted to know more about Skole, are those practices or some of these ritual practices that we've been talking about, what would you recommend for further study? Three books come to mind. One book is kind of a more general book that addresses the recovery of liberal arts learning, and that's The Liberal Arts Tradition, A Philosophy of Christian Classical Education by Kevin Clark and Ravi Jain. They have some chapters in their book on piety and on gymnastic and musical education that are relevant to this idea, particularly musical education as an as a cultivation of wonder or an education in wonder. They excel at that. That's one book. Another book is The Intellectual Life, Its Spirit Conditions and Methods by A.J. Sertelange. A.G. Sertelange is a French, he's a French monk. And it's a kind of classic work. It's a little bit challenging to read in some respects. It's written in the French, translated into English. But he recovers this idea that to be a student, and that's what he means by intellectuals, to be a student, not necessarily to be a really smart person. Our souls must be cultivated in some important virtues like constancy, perseverance, temperance, courage, humility, and love. And this is so important for us to be able to be at rest, we have to have cultivated virtues. These virtues have to be cultivated in a student. Another book that addresses this directly is a book by Josef Pieper, a German writing in the 1940s, a German theologian and philosopher, called Leisure, the Basis of Culture, or Scholle, <laughs> the Basis of Culture. And it's, it's also a challenging read because of it's German now into English, but it's so it recovers Scholle very, very well. So I would just caution your readers, the liberal arts tradition will be the easiest read of these three. The intellectual life isn't that challenging, actually, but the Peeper's book will be a challenge. Peeper also, on Kindle, you can get his collected essays. And there's some wonderful essays collected by Joseph Peeper on the subject of Scholle. And then finally, I would just mention, say, books seven and eight of Aristotle's Politics. And uh, I think chapter eight is actually a pretty quick chapter. It's not so the reading isn't as long as you think. In those chapters, he talks about Scholle from the ancient Greek perspective. And as somebody who's recently had a, a little bit of experience with Aristotle, he's not as daunting as some of us might first feel. That's I, right. I found him a little more approachable than I expected him to be. So definitely yes. something worth looking into. Yeah, it depends on what you read of his. If you read his uh, metaphysics, you know, you might find that challenging, but his politics and his ethics are very accessible. Yes, yes. Well, Dr. Perrin, thank you so much for coming on and chatting with us today about this idea of restful learning and also these liturgical practices and how we can use them in our morning time to bring that restful learning to our homeschools. You're very welcome. Thank you for having me, Pam, and all the best to you as you help other homeschooling parents to recover some of these great ideas and traditions. Okay, for today's basket bonus, we have for you guys a worksheet, and the worksheet is broken into two parts. The first part of the worksheet 
are a few leading questions to walk you through doing one of those five census surveys that Dr. Perrin talked about in the podcast. So the upper section is about that. And then on the bottom section, we have a few questions down there that are going to help you evaluate some of the traditions of your own faith practice and how you might bring those into your morning time to create some ritual. So we hope you find this worksheet really helpful to you as you start thinking about school A and ritual in your morning time and in your homeschool. You can download your basket bonus by heading on over to the show notes for this episode. And that would be edsnapshots.com forward slash YMB4. We hope you enjoy. And there you have it, another episode of Your Morning Basket. Now, if you would like to get links to all of Dr. Perrin's book recommendations or any of the other things that we talked about on the show today, you can find those in the show notes for this particular episode. And that is at edsnapshots.com forward slash YMB4. We link everything up there for you to make it easy to find along with the basket bonus worksheet for this episode. And I just want to thank you guys for all of your wonderful comments and encouragement on the podcast. It's been really great. And for those of you who have left ratings and reviews in iTunes, we really appreciate those too. That's it for now. We'll be back in a couple of weeks with another episode. And until then, we encourage you to keep pursuing truth, goodness, and beauty in your homeschool.